Uh, it's now a pleasure to introduce today's second speaker, Dr. Shabi Shakil. So Shabi did his doctoral work at the University of Helsinki in the lab of Sarah Butcher studying uh, pi coronaviruses and, uh, and their entry into host cells. Um, he then moved to Cambridge for postdoctoral work in the lab of Dr. Laurie Passmore, uh, who you may remember from her fragile nucle nucleosome seminar last summer. There he did some really fantastic work on the Faconia anemia, Mani Bikudin Ligase complex. Um, and on the back of that, he's recently moved to Melbourne, I think, in Australia, uh, where he started his own lab last year at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. Um, and today he's going to be sharing with us mechanistic insights into Facona anemia DNA repair pathway. Apologize, I think I just terribly mispronounced that. Um, but so please join me in giving a warm, if virtual, welcome to today's second speaker, Dr. Shabi Shakil. Thanks, Ban. Can you all hear me fine? Yes. Great. So good morning and good afternoon from wherever you are joining. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work in this global forum. In my lab, we study structures of multi-protein complexes to understand how they assemble and function. One of our areas of interest is to understand how cells respond to DNA damage. We do so by studying Fanconianemia proteins. This allows us not to only understand how this process works in normal cells, but also how it goes wrong in Fanconi anemia. Today, I'll tell you about our work on determining the structures of Fanconi anemia proteins, such as the one shown on this slide, and what they tell us about the molecular basis of the disease. I conducted this work when I was a postdoc with Laurie Passmore at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. DNA damage can occur in many ways. For today's talk, I'll tell you about one that leads to interstrand cross-linking of DNA and are repaired by Fanconi anemia pathway. Such DNA cross-links can occur after exposure to chemicals, including chemotherapeutic drugs, and alcohol, and also because of normal cellular metabolism. These crosslinks block DNA from being replicated and block transcription as well. And if these crosslinks cannot be repaired, it causes genome instability and leads to Fanconi anemia, which is a rare recessive genetic disorder. There is a wide spectrum of symptoms in Fanconi anemia patients including developmental defects, bone marrow failure, and cancer. But at molecular level, all Fanconinima patients have the inability to repair DNA crosslinks effectively. If you look at the molecular defects in Fanconinima, there are over 22 genes that can be mutated. And the Fanconinima proteins encoded by these genes can be classified as components that act at three different layers in the pathway. First, there's a group of proteins that associate with each other to form the FA core complex. And by far, most of the mutations are found in this complex. Second, there are two proteins, FANG-D2 and FANG-I, that are the substrate of the FA core complex. And finally, the third set of proteins are involved in downstream repair. So how does this pathway work? Interstrand crosslinks cause collision of replication four in S phase of the cell cycle. This collision is sensed by Fanconianemia proteins. At least eight of these proteins form the E3 ligase called FA core complex, which monoubicutinates a heterodimer substrate made of FANG-D2 and FANG-I. The activation of FANG-D2 FANG-I recruits a set of endonucleases that will unhook the interstrand crosslink which gets eventually repaired by homologous recombination. T2I activation is the key event in this pathway, but it is mechanistically least understood. We want to understand the activation step and to do so, we use an in vitro biochemistry coupled with structural biology approach. 
Let me briefly tell you how an E3 ligase works. An E3 ligase is a protein that conjugates a ubiquitin onto other proteins. An E3 works in a cascade of E1, E2, and E3 enzymes that transfer a ubiquitin to a lysine side chain of the substrate protein. Now many E3 ligases contain a ring domain that binds and positions E2 to allow ubiquitin transfer. The Fe core complex contains a ring domain in its Spank L subunit. The ring domain containing E3s are not enzymatic. They only act as facilitators to correctly position the activated E2 and the substrate, allowing efficient transfer of ubiquitin. Now the Fe core complex is much larger than many other E3s. And it is likely that the complex architecture of this multi-subunit E3s like Fe core complex allow extensive regulation to make sure that the correct proteins are modified at the correct time and place in the cell. Previously, it was shown that purified Fankel, the subunit which harbors the E3 ligase activity within the Fe core complex is sufficient to monobicinate FangD2 in the presence of DNA in a site-specific manner. And this ubiquitinated FangD2 within the heterodimer is enough to drive the pathway forward. But mutation in any one of the Fe core complex subunits can abolish FangD2 ubiquitination and thus lead to defective DNA repair and a disease. So the major questions are, what is the role of other subunits of the Fe core complex? And why do we need FangD2 FangKai heterodimer? when monobigotination of FANG-D2 is enough to uh, drive the pathway forward. An understanding of how the Fe core complex work is really hampered by lack of a fully in vitro reconstituted system. And that was because of major challenges in establishing one. First, the complex is present in low abundance making it difficult to purify from cells for structural and biochemical characterization. Second, this complex is not found in lower eukaryotes like yeast, which allow easy genetic manipulation. And finally, the complexity and size generate additional challenges to work with this particular complex. Earlier, Ethan Rajendra, former postdoc from Laurie's lab, demonstrated that the Fe core complex is indeed formed by eight stably associated subunits that he pulled down from chicken DD40 cells. Eason also showed that intact Fe core complex robustly ubiquitinates in comparison to isolated Fang L. And this ubiquitination increases in presence of DNA, which raises the question, the role of DNA in Fe core activation. To answer these questions, we needed a large amount of Fe core complex for our structural and biochemical work. We cloned the entire complex in Baclovirus expression system. This allowed us to obtain milligram quantities of the recombinant Fe core for the first time. Using our ubiquitination assays, we showed that the recombinant complex is active and it monobicotinates FANG-D2 in the presence of DNA. We use CRYM to determine its structure. This is one such representative micrograph we collected for the Fe core complex data. We boxed out several individual particles of Fe core from several of these micrographs. We classified these particles into several classes based on the two dimensional shapes and orientations. Here are the six major 2D classes which we obtained by 2D classification. The level of details in these 2D classes were remarkable as can be seen by the presence of secondary structure elements such as helices in them. If we go from 2D to 3D, this is how the Fe core complex looks like. It is at an overall resolution of 4.2 angstrom. The Fe core complex, unlike several other large multi-protein complexes, is long and extended with dimensions of 18 angstrom by 25 angstrom. 
The central region in the complex is more resolved than the peripheral region, indicating flexibility. We confirmed this uh, conformational heterogeneity using multi-body refinement tool in the image processing program called Reliant. We observed majority of movement resides in top and the base regions. Thus, we used focus classification and refinement technique in Reliant to improve densities for the top and base regions. Modeling into this EM map was challenging because firstly, we are at moderate resolution. And secondly, there are not many crystal structures. The homology models were poor because most of them are orphan proteins. Therefore, we use complementary techniques to aid us in map interpretation. To investigate the stoichiometry and composition of the purified complex, we used non-covalent native mass spectrometry in collaboration with Robinson Lab at Oxford. Native mass spec showed that the overall complex may be asymmetric with non-uniform subunit stoichiometry. FANC B, FANC L, and FAP 100 were present in most of the subcomplexes identified by native mass spec, suggesting that they may comprise a central core. Next, we did series of dropout experiments. We, we dropped one protein at a time from the complex and observed the effect in the density at 2D class level. This indicated the location of individual proteins within the cryem map. For example, the 2D class averages of subcomplex lacking FANG A appeared similar to the intact FA core complex with no obvious missing density. Therefore, FANG A may be conformationally heterogeneous and blurred out in reconstruction, or it may dissociate or denature during sample preparation. Upon generating many more such subcomplexes, we observed an arm radiating out from central region in intact FA core complex and all the subcomplexes except BL100. Therefore, we assigned that arm to be Feng Chi. We performed cross linking mass pack in collaboration with Rapsilba Lab in Berlin to reveal protein-protein interactions at single residue level. We obtained about 834 inter and intra cross links with 40% of these within the FANG P, FANG L and FAP100. Again, reinforcing our native mass spec observation that these three proteins make up a central core. This was also previously observed from the work by Andrew Dean's lab in Melbourne. Given the importance of the central core comprising of FANG B, FANG L, and FAP400, we used hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spec to reveal regions of FANG B and FAP100 that become protected or exposed upon interaction with FANG L. We also used comparative modeling for uh, model bending into a cryem map. With this integrative approach, we build a polyalanine model into the EM map. In collaboration with uh, Frank DeMau and David Baker's lab, we developed a pipeline for assigning sequence to our polyalanine model that utilized artificial intelligence-based model prediction tools. Here is the model of entire FA core complex in the EM density map. Based on function, we can divide this complex into four modules. FANG B, FAP400 form the molecular scaffold. They are present in two copies and occupy the central region of the complex. They provide the hub for other subunits to come and bind onto the complex. They have beta propellers on the outsides, which are connected to the center of the core through coil coils. Despite no sequence similarity, they have a remarkably similar structural organization, indicating common ancestor. FANG-G, along with FANG-A, make the chromatin recruitment module, 
where we can see two copies of Fang G in the complex on either side of it. And they contain TPR domains, but no Fang A is seen, probably due to its high flexibility. Our biochemical assays, along with subunit dropout experiments, show that Fang A tethers to the FA4 complex through Fang G and is thus not required for structural integrity of the complex. At the base of the complex, we have Fang C, E, and F, which make up the substrate recruitment module and are present in the form of an arc of helices. Finally, I get to the heart of this complex, which is FANG-L subunit that contains the ring domain. Like FANG-P, FAP100, and FANG-G, it is also present in two copies on either side of the complex. We see all three domains, including ring domain for FANG-L at the base. But FANG-L at the top is mostly flexible, except for the ELF domain. This different arrangement of Fankel at top and base may lead to different roles for each one of them. Now let me take a detour here and show you again the 2D classes of the FA core complex. You may have noticed that there is a symmetric class in here. We determine its structure to about five angstrom. And because the complex has local regions that are symmetric, we took advantage of this symmetry. And Shouda He from Shou's lab developed the local symmetry algorithm to improve the resolution for this symmetric region. We improved this resolution for our structure from 5 angstrom to 4.6 angstrom, which is not much. But there was a remarkable improvement in appearance of densities after the application of local symmetry. This allowed us to build a model in the EM map. The model showed that this is a subcomplex of FA core, and it comprises of two copies of FAP, uh, FANG B, FAP 400, FANG L, and FANG G. Now, let me tell you uh, how, what the structure tells us about the FA core function. FANG B and FAP 100 are the molecular scaffolds which coordinate positioning of FANG L and all the other subunits. This explains why the intact complex is more active than isolated FANCAL, because it really stabilizes the FANCAL protein. FANCAL at the base, which is cradled by other subunits, plays a structural role, as our modeling has shown steric clashes for binding of ubiquitin carrying E2 to it. Therefore, this leaves the FANCAL at the top to act as the active E3 ligase which binds to the ubiquitin loaded E2. The substrate protein FANG D2 FANG I interact with the complex through the substrate recognition module. FA core brings the two of them close enough so that they are correctly aligned for ubiquitin transfer. This hypothesis is being confirmed by a more recent structure of FA core bound to E2 and substrate from Pavletich lab. So what does this structure tell us about the disease? If we map the mutations on the structure, we observe fanconinemia patients are rarely found, uh, patient mutations are rarely found in the central core. Instead, most mutations are found in the peripheral subunits. Initially, we thought that these mutations will explain the most critical interactions within the complex. But as you see, most of the mutations are on periphery, which is counterintuitive. Our structure explains why this is the case. It is because any mutations in the catalytic core will lead to disintegration of the complex and are non-viable. And whatever handful of mutations we see in catalytic core actually lead to more severe form of the disease in comparison to the one in the periphery. Now that we know how FA core complex looks like and how it functions, we moved on to understand what happens to its substrate FANG-D2, FANG-I after ubiquitination and why DNA is so integral to the whole process of ubiquitination. To do this exciting work, I joined hands with Pablo Alcon, another postdoc in Laurie's lab who led this endeavor. 
Crystal structure of mouse heterodimer of Fang D2 Fang I from Pavletich lab showed that it is pseudosymmetric. The monoplicatation site on Fang D2 as well as on Fang I were included in the structure. Therefore, the structure couldn't explain how FAQ complex monoplicatinates these substrates. What is the role of DNA in the activation of the pathway? And why do we need D2I heterodimer when D2 by itself is enough to drive the whole pathway? To answer these questions, we purified ubiquitinated D2I using a his tag on ubiquitin. Here is the crime structure of Fang D2 Fang I from chicken, which is similar to the previous crystal structure of D2I from mouse. In turn, Surprisingly, the ubiquitinated D2I cryem map showed that D2I now encloses our DNA. When we built model into this cryem map, it threw a lot of surprises. First, the ubiquitin site of Fang D2 is open and is occupied by ubiquitin, where ubiquitin makes extensive contacts with Fang Kai. Secondly, Fang I, despite structurally similar to Fang D2, have its monoplicatation site still occluded. Finally, and as a more exciting observation, the structure showed ubiquitin acting as a molecular pin, which ensures that the D2I clamp onto the DNA. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first description of ubiquitin acting to stabilize a protein complex conformation. This leaves us with the question why we need D2I heteronimer when ubiquitination of D2 is all that is vital to drive the Fanconinemia pathway. To answer this, Pablo did a clever experiment where he tested the oligomeric state of Fang D2 and Fang I using gel filtration. He used co-expressed D2I as the control, where we know that these two proteins form a heterodimer. Next, he purified Fang I and saw that it runs as a monomer on gel filtration. In contrast to our surprise, Fang D2 ran as a homodimer with its gel profile peak coinciding with that of D2I heterodimer. When Pablo mixed separately purified Fang D2 and Fang I and ran on gel filtration, these proteins ran as a heterodimer, indicating that Fang I can displace a Fang D2 protomer. Next, we tested the DNA binding ability of these proteins using DNA gel shift assays. These assays showed that co-express D2I heterodimer and the Fang I monomer can readily bind DNA. But the Fang D2 homodimer do not have DNA binding activity. Upon mixing the free D2I, the free D2 and I, and therefore forming the heterodimer, the DNA binding activity can be rescued. This intrigued us as why Fang D2 homodimer doesn't bind DNA. To answer this, we purified Fang D2 by itself and solved its structure. The structure showed that the Fang D2 is a closed homodimer and resembles ubiquitinated D2I structure. Upon building a model into this map, we observed that the site of ubiquitination is occluded. Our ubiquitination assay confirmed that the Fang D2 by itself can't be ubiquitinated. So given these structures, we propose a model where one of the protomers of Fang D2 gets displaced by Fang I to form a heterodimer. Upon recruitment to the DNA, the ubiquitin site on Fang D2 gets exposed, which is then ubiquitinated by FA core complex that results in a clamp-like structure. This remodeling of D2I results in a new surface that can be recognized by downstream endonucleases. To wrap up today, I have shown you some of the structures we did to understand the key steps of Fanconinemia pathway. The structure of FA core complex revealed functional asymmetry of ring domain containing Fang L and why mutations in the catalytic core of this complex are so lethal. 
And from the ubiquitinated D2I structure, we learned that D2I clamps onto the DNA once it is ubiquitinated. With that, I would like to thank Laurie Pasmo for being such an awesome PI and giving me so much freedom on these projects. And also the rest of the Pasmo group, especially Eason and Pablo for this wonderful teamwork. And also Tamara who is carrying this work forward. And thank you to all our collaborators without whom this work would have not been possible. I would also like to thank my small team at VEHI who are looking at gene regulation through the lens of epigenetics and building us some cool cryo sample preparation devices. And thank you all for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Shabby. That was, that was really cool. Um, so for uh, people have questions, feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask them yourself. Um, I have a few um, while we wait for that, which are, I'm, very much not a structural biologist. So I can't ask you too much about the structure other than say that I thought it was beautiful. Um, but on the pathway itself, I was wondering why, why is the bone marrow the most affected? Because um, naively, naively, I'd expect most cycling cells to be dependent on this DNA repair pathway. Um, so I'm wondering if, if, if that's known or what, what your thoughts are on that. Uh, uh... I think there is some information about it, but the whole Fankini anemia comes out from the blood disorder. So what we see is the complete destruction of uh, the bone marrow when you have the Fankini anemia patients because they have the inability to you know, repair any kind of intrastrand crosslinks. And apparently that affects the most of bone marrow. Uh, but I don't really have a clear answer for that for you. Right. But that's all I know. Um, do you know if the complex is expressed more in, in some cells versus others? That's a good question. I am actually not sure about it. Yeah. And then I guess the other question, my thoughts going into it were like either it's something about the bone marrow that so maybe they like the blood cells that they divide a lot and they're really dependent on it. Or it could be that other cells have some redundant pathway. Like are there other pathways to repair interest? Interstrand crosslinks that maybe are, aren't expressed in the in the blood cells. As far as I know, they aren't. But uh, lately, there have been a couple of new uh, level of redundancy, which is seen in uh, the where we have the interstrand crosslinks. But it's still not very clear how those pathways actually work. But there is some redundancy at some level within the whole uh, repair of interstrand crosslinks. Yeah, but like how does that work? Still, it's still a mystery because many of the Fankin anemia patients do get these head and neck cancers. But what mm -hmm. really results uh, in Fankin anemia patients uh, having that high incidence rate of head and neck cancer is still unknown. So all this, you know, the origin of cancer from Fankin anemia is quite interesting. Yeah, and because you mentioned that the that um, species like yeast don't have this pathway. How yeah. do they repair an, an interstrand crosslink? Good question. I think some of these are uh, still conserved there. So, uh, for example, I definitely know of FANCAM that it, there is a version of FANCAM in bacteria and yeast as well, which is part of the FANCAM uh, pathway. And probably there is some version of FANCAL as well in there, okay. but it can't be certain. Yeah. Um, I was just intrigued by the um, the fact that you just mentioned about the um, high recurrence of uh, cancers in the Fakonimia patients because I mean I, I would expect a higher rate of mutation that might uh, increase uh, the risk of cancer once you are able to escape the stalling of the replication for. Um, do you know I mean if it is um, so two questions actually. At what time during the lifespan do you do the symptoms of Fakun anemia start to be evident if it's already early on in childhood or later in adulthood? And as well, uh, at what, what age do you see the cancers arising? Just to have an idea of what, what's the time scale that it takes to, to get this kind of mutation piling up at that level. Yeah, uh, so I'm not a 
Fangoni anemia um, uh, clinician, but what I have seen is uh, the, the Fangoni anemia symptoms are very obvious right from the childhood. And uh, children as young as four or five years can get that. Yeah. But because uh, with advancement in bone marrow transplantation techniques, uh, the survivability rate has now increased like by decades. So, okay. I've got uh, on another tack. Um, so, like this complex, it will add the mono ubiquitin um, to that to to that lysine. I was wondering, do you ever see? other modifications of the lysine that would block the ability for it to be ubiquilated? Like if it was acetylated or methylated with that, is, does that happen? And could that be something that's going on in the cells? Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't seen uh, such kind of modifications, but we do know that this D2I does like to get phosphorylated mm -hmm. uh, before it gets ubiquitinated. But what that does is still a bit unclear. And we are working on it. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of work with different like chromatin modifying enzymes for dictate like influencing which repair pathway. Yeah, um, and so there's a much known about how kind of chromatin regulation is is impacting aconeamenia uh, repair. Uh, I don't think that's much known about it, uh, but. Uh, one, so the whole idea is that once you get these uh, cross links, so there is the stalling of the replication fork and you don't get much replication and uh, any transcription. So this, uh, the whole pathway actually triggers off during the S phase. So where, where the stalling is happening and that's where the whole pathway starts, you know, triggering, but nothing else, I guess, is known about it. Yeah. Great. So, so there are um, a lot of unknowns. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So I think uh, unless there's other, any other further questions, we can end the seminar portion now. So thank you again to both our speakers for two fantastic talks.